الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم كنتم خير أمة نقرجت للناس تأمرون بالمعروف وتنهون عن المنكر وتؤمنون بالله رب شلي صدري ويسل لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني أفكا وكولي أول كم أول الفيوز of the Peach TV Network the Peach TV English the Peach TV Urdu the Peach TV Bangla and the Peach TV Chinese as well as my four social media platforms which are the Facebook the YouTube the Instagram and Twitter I welcome all the viewers with Islamic greetings Assalamu Alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh May peace mercy and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of Almighty God be on all of you I welcome all of you to this program, Ask Dr. Zakir, Season 5, Session 2. Here you are most welcome to ask any questions on Islam and comparative religion or any question which a non-Muslim may have posed you and you are unable to reply or any question you find in the media which is directing Islam or which is difficult for you to reply, this is the opportunity. You can ask your question on any of the four social media platforms but the best would be to ask your question as a text message on the whatsapp by mentioning your question by mentioning your question in brief along with your name, your profession, your city and country of origin to the WhatsApp number plus six zero double one two one double three double three six zero. I repeat plus six zero double one two one double three double three six zero. So if you mention your question on the WhatsApp as a text message, there are more likely chances that it would be accepted. Put the volume off. Yeah? <coughs> the first question on the WhatsApp is from Firdos Sheikh a marketing executive from New York, USA. Is it permissible to wish our Christian friends Merry Christmas? A similar question is posed by Khatija Soleiman. She is a university student from London, UK. Can we accept food or gifts from our Christian friends on the occasion of Christmas? A similar question is posed by Sultan Khan from Toronto, Canada. Even though we know celebrating Christmas is wrong, can we politely wish our Christian friends compliments of the season or happy days? In our heart, we disagree with them, but to maintain the friendship, can we say good words to them? The basic question asked is that can a Muslim wish their Christian friends Merry Christmas? Or can they exchange food and gifts on the occasion of Krish, on the occasion of Christmas? Or knowing it is wrong, can we politely say some kind words? Or can we say happy season? Or compliments of the season? Is it permissible? As far as wishing non-Muslims on the festivals, most of the non-Muslim festivals they involve either shirk or they involve things which are not permitted in our sharia so most of the festivals since they involve shirk or things which are prohibited in our sharia but national wishing them on things which is wrong is prohibited in islam allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious quran in surah maida chapter number five verse number two that 
help one another in bir and taqwa in virtue in righteousness and good deeds we should help each other and the verse continues but do not help one another in sin and transgression so we cannot help one another whether it be muslims or non muslims in things which are prohibited in things which are sin allah subhanahu wa ta'ala further says in the quran quran in surah furqan chapter number 25 verse number 72 that those who do not witness things which are false or do not witness falsehood so here allah says in the quran that the two believers the moment they do not witness falsehood so when we wish a non muslim in the festivals which is against the sharia but natural we are agreeing to things which are wrong and we are saying that what they are doing is right it is like we know very well that most of the festivals in what shirk and especially christmas so when we wish someone merry christmas what are we saying is that we are congratulating them for the festival of christmas and christmas is a festival which the christian believe that jesus christ peace be upon him who they consider to be god or the son of god was born on the 25th of december and they celebrate christmas as the birthday of their god now when we wish them merry christmas what are we doing we are actually congratulating them on the shirk and giving shahada and bearing witness nauz billah that allah subhanahu wa taala was born on the 25th of december so we are actually taking part in the shirk and allah clearly mentions in the glorious quran in surah furqan chapter number 25 verse number 72 that they do not witness falsehood allah says in surah maida chapter 5 verse number 2 that do not help one another in sin and transgression so when we wish them merry christmas we are giving shahada we are bearing witness that nauz billah allah begot a son on the 25th of december or nauz billah allah was born on the 25th of december both of these things are absolutely against the teaching of islam allah says in the quran in surah maryam chapter number 7 chapter number 19 verse number 88 to 92 وَقَالُوا اتَّخَذَ الرَّحْمَنُ وَلَدًا and they say Allah has begotten a son لَقَدْ جِئْتُمْ شَيْئًا إِذَا indeed they have put forth a thing most monstrous that anyone who says that Allah has begotten a son it is the biggest abuse you can give to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala تَقَادُوا السَّمَوَاتِ وَتَفَتَّرْنَا مِنْهُ if the sky that feelings it would have burst open for the khairu jibalu hadda and the mountain would have fallen down to utter ruin if anyone say that allah has begotten a son if the sky had feelings it would have burst open the mountain would have fallen down to utter ruin and imagine we muslims who claim to be believing in one allah subhanahu wa ta'ala believing in tawhid against shirk if we wish them merry christmas we are giving shahada that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has begotten a son on the 25th of december it is one of the biggest sin that's the reason all almost all the classical scholars the medieval scholars they said it is haram according to sheik according to sheik ul islam ibn taymiyah he says that wishing the non muslims on the festival is prohibited even exchanging food or wearing their clothes or bathing or using firework on the festivals of the non muslims it is prohibited we cannot even take part in the celebrations we cannot even wish them on the days and sheikh ul islam ibn taymiyah is very clear that all these things are haram and it is prohibited in islam according to ibn qayyum may allah have mercy on him he says that wishing the non muslims on the festivals most of which involve shirk and things which are haram it's totally prohibited in islam it is like wishing them for example someone does adultery and you're saying good you have done adultery someone is drinking alcohol and you're saying good you have drunk alcohol these are sins so when you wish them in the festival you are agreeing with them that what they're doing is wrong and that is totally prohibited so almost all the scholars that you find the classical and the medieval scholars they say it is prohibited they today you may find some you know some scholars who may say 
it is permissible because there is no text in the Quran which prohibits greeting them or exchanging gifts, etc. But this is only in small number and they are not following the classical scholars. So according to me, I do agree with Shaykh Islam ibn Taymiyyah and ibn al-Qayyum and most of the majority of scholars that wishing non-Muslim during the festival is prohibited and all the four uh, and if you read that almost all the classical scholars have prohibited. So according to me, wishing them, wishing the Christians in Merry Christmas is prohibited even saying to them good words because you want to be polite to them or saying compliment of the season or saying have a happy day wishing good things for the non-muslims worldly things it is permitted there is no problem at all but specifically picking on the days of the festival and wishing them on this festival this is not permitted because you are going out of the way to wish them on the festival that means you are encouraging the festival and you are agreeing with the festival which is prohibited otherwise wishing good things for the non-muslims good health may they have wealth it's all permitted normally but specifically wishing them on the festival is actually encouraging them and according to me and according to the majority of the scholars according to the majority of the scholars this is prohibited taking part in the celebration or exchanging gifts or wearing good clothes is prohibited. I would go a step further and say that we have many of the Muslims who are businessmen who try and do more business during the festivals of the non-Muslims and they have a Christmas sale then they have a Diwali sale thinking they'll do more business according to me even this is prohibited. The moment it's a Christmas sale that means you're agreeing with Christmas that means you're agreeing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows Billah begotten a son on the 25th of December you are agreeing that Allah was born on 25th of December knows Billah so for a Muslim to wish the non-Muslims on the festival or to take part in the festival or exchange gifts or even try and do more business taking advantage of that festival and saying we are having a Christmas sale it is not permitted and it is not correct according to the Sharia there may be certain non-Muslims who may not understand and who may feel offended. And I give the reply that in our festivals, we don't force any of the non-Muslims that they should follow a festival. Imagine if a Hindu who is a vegetarian, I would not expect him to come and wish me during Bakri Eid or Eid al-Zaha, Eid al-Adha, to wish me happy Eid because he doesn't believe in eating goat, eating meat, eating beef. So I would not be offended if he does not come and meet me happy Eid al -Adha. Imagine if I tell all the Hindus, even though you are a vegetarian, which many are, you should come and wish me on Eid al -Adha, they will be offended. How can they wish me on Eid al Adha, which, uh, and we know that in Eid al Adha we sacrifice a goat or we sacrifice a cow, and this they think is wrong. So I respect their views. So similarly, a non Muslim should respect my views. I expect the Christian to respect my views. Now the question comes that if a, if a Christian comes and wishes you, if a Christian comes and wishes you, you cannot reply. Suppose he said Merry Christmas, you cannot reply Merry Christmas or same to you. This is also prohibited. What you can do is best is to keep silent. The best is if you know comparative religion. If you have seen my lectures, replying with hikmah is the best. But if you don't know any reply, the best is to keep silent. Or you can say that may peace be on you. Or you can wish them may Allah give you hidayah. That is the best. Wishing hidayah. For the non-Muslim is the best dua you can do for, to them. But if a non-Muslim comes and wishes me Merry Christmas, I will ask him that why are you celebrating this Christmas? So he will tell me that Christmas is the birthday of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. So I will ask him, does the Bible say that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was born on the 25th of December? And the answer is no. 
Nowhere does the Bible say that Jesus Christ peace be upon him was born on the 25th of December. This 25th of December is the birthday of the pagan gods. Previously, the pagan gods before the birth of Jesus Christ peace be upon him. In the Greek philosophy and, and in many other mythology, they believed this was the birthday of their god. Some believed it was the birthday of sun god. And in different mythologies, in different philosophies, this was a common date, 25th of December. So the Christians, to make it easily acceptable by the people of that time, they started saying that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was born on the 24th of December. In fact, if you read the Bible, it says that, that Mary, may Allah have mercy on her, who was the mother of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, when she was pregnant and she was asked to shake the tree, date cell. And we know that dates are not, dates don't appear during winter. So from this we come to know that when Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was born, it was not winter, it was summer. So for sure, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was not born in December, neither on 25th of December. So when a Christian asked me, I will start doing dawah to him. And I will say, who is the Jesus Christ, peace be upon him? He will try to tell me that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, is Almighty God. So I will tell him that, can you point out a single unequivocal statement from your Bible, anywhere from your Bible, where Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, himself says that he is God or where he says worship me. And if you know your dawah very well, you can continue and you can prove. So during these occasions, if you are well versed with comparative religion, you can take this opportunity for calling them towards Islam. In no way can you agree with what they are doing is wrong. Allah clearly says in the Quran, in Surah Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 110, the verse I started this session with. Allah says, Kuntum khaira ummatin ukhrijat nas. O ye Muslims, ye are the best of people evolved for mankind. The reason Allah calls us the khaira ummah, the best of people is, because we enjoin what is good and we forbid what is wrong and we believe in Allah. We are called the Khaira Ummah, the best of people, because we are supposed to enjoin what is good and forbid what is wrong. So here we have to call them to the truth of Tawheed and forbid them from doing wrong. You cannot enjoin what is wrong. You cannot wish them on the festivals which is against the teaching of Islam. What you have to do is call them to Tawheed and to Dawah to them and you can Surely, watch my video cassettes on similarity with Islam and Christianity, on, on was Jewish Christ, peace be upon him, crucified, is Jesus God, and various cassettes which will give you information on how you can convey the message of Islam to the Christians during this festival of death. Hope that answers the question. The next question from Ashikul Islam, a student from Dhaka, Bangladesh. Assalamu alaikum, sir. In our country, large number of people do not pray five times, do not fast in Ramadan, also watch movies, listen to music, do not maintain distance with non mehram take bribe, keep backbiting, etc. They know these are not permitted in Islam, but they continue. They think they will be good practicing Muslims when they reach the age of 50 to 60 years. And then they will make Tawbah. My question, will their Tawbah be accepted by Allah even if they get a chance to do Tawbah? Will they go to Jannah? What does Islam say about them?
Brother Ashikul Islam has asked a very important question that in his country Bangladesh and there are many Muslims in different parts of the world who are like what he has described that they do not pray five times a day, they do not fast in the month of Ramadan, they listen to music, they watch, uh, they watch un-Islamic movies, they watch un-Islamic movies, they do not maintain the hijab, they bribe, they do backbiting, etc. And though these Muslims know very well that these are not permitted in Islam, many are major sins, and others are also sins in Islam, they think that let them enjoy life, they will continue doing it and inshallah when they reach the age of 50 or 60, they will do Toba and they know Allah is Rahman or Rahim, is Ghafoor or Rahim, He will inshallah forgive. So the question posed by Brother Ashik al-Islam is that will Allah accept the Toba if they have planned in such a way? Will they go to Jannah? What is the guidance to be given to them. Point number one, that if a Muslim knows that praying, not praying five times a day is a sin, not fasting in the month of Ramadan is a sin, listening to music, not doing hijab, bribing, cheating, backbiting, if these are sins and he continues doing them thinking that before dying, maybe at the age of 50 or 60 he'll do toba. And let him enjoy life now and Allah is Rahman or Rahim, Ghafoor or Rahim, he will forgive. So th they think they are smart. But I would tell them they are basically very illogical. The reason is that what guarantee can any human being give that he will live till the age of 50 or 60? I am aware that average lifespan of a human being in the world is approximately 75 years. For the gents and for the females, it is about 79 to 80 years. But there are chances that you may die before the age of 50, maybe at the age of 20 or 25 or 30 or 40, possible. The chances may be less, but there are possibilities, 10%, 15% that you may die before the age of 50. And what if you die before the age of 50? How will you answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? You cannot say that I thought I will do toba at the age of 50 or 60, does Allah say that don't do these sins at the age of 50, 60 and before the age of 50, 60 are permitted, what will happen? You will ruin your akhirah. I would say that the illogical because of various reasons. Hypothetically, even if I agree with them that they want to do toba at the age of 50, suppose the person says that I will have alcohol, I will smoke, I know it is haram, at the age of 50 or 60, I will do toba. Now, if a person knows it is wrong, and for him to not start that sin itself is very easy. But for him to have it and then stop it is difficult. For example, if a Muslim knows that drinking alcohol is haram, and he says, okay, I know it's haram, maybe I'll drink, I'm, I'm of the age of maybe 15, 19 years, I will start drinking for the next maybe 30 years till the age of 50 and then I'll do Toba. If a person knows it is wrong and he does not start it, drinking itself, it's the easiest. If he has alcohol once and then stops it, it is more difficult. But if he has it for many years and then he, if he wants to stop, it is all the more difficult. Imagine a person having alcohol for 30 years and then he says I will stop it it is very very difficult. The chances are very small. And for Toba to accept it, one of the criteria is that you stop the sin. If you know it is wrong, you are drinking alcohol for 15, 20 years, 30 years and then you say that you will stop it. This, the chances that you will be successful is very small. The chances you will be successful is very little. And that's the reason I would say that he is illogical. The moment you realize it is wrong and you stop it, that is easiest. And earlier you stop, the better it is. There is one more criteria for repentance to be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that you have to undo it if you can. Imagine if 
you have been involved in bribing, if you have been, if you have been involved in backbiting, and you are bribing for so many years, and then you said, okay, in bribing people, I get a lot of benefits, I make a lot of money, at the age of 50 or 60, I will stop. So for 30, 40 years, you have been bribing, and once you agree it is wrong, then you say you stop it. One of the criteria for repentance is you have to undo it. Now, how can you undo it? Imagine if you have bribed so many people and have taken the rights of so many other human beings. Is it possible that all the 50 years that the people you have deprived and the people you have sinned against, will you be able to undo it? And the reply is no. That is the reason I feel that the person who knows it's a sin and if he plans to stop it after 50 years, he is one of the most illogical person. Because for repentance to be accepted, there are five criteria. Number one, agree what you're doing is wrong. Number two, you have to stop it immediately. Number three, ask for forgiveness and repentance. Number four, you have to undo it if you can. And number five, don't do it in future. So if you do all these five things and you sincerely ask for forgiveness, inshallah Allah will forgive you. Regarding the questioner, that if these people reach the age of 50, will Allah forgive them? And the answer is, if they sincerely repent, Allah will forgive them. But what is the chance that they will reach till the age of 50? What is the chance that they'll be sincere in asking forgiveness? What is the chance that they will be able to stop it? Once you're addicted to most of the sins, whether it be alcohol, whether it be smoking, whether it be bribing, stopping it after doing it for 30, 40 years is extremely difficult. So that is the reason I say it would be illogical for a person who knows it's a sin, who knows it is haram, to do it and then say, I will stop it at the age of 50 or 60. But regarding a question, will Allah forgive them? Allah says in several hadith that if any of his servants sin the full night and if they ask for forgiveness in the morning, Allah will forgive them. If a servant sin the full day and ask for forgiveness in the night, Allah will forgive them. There is one hour in the night towards the one third of the night before sunrise, before the time for dawn, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks, is there anyone who wants anything? And if anyone asks for forgiveness, inshallah Allah will forgive them. Allah is ghafoor rahim But will Allah forgive them? Inshallah. But the question is, what are the chances? It is very illogical and I'd like to give you a few examples. For example, if you are suffering from a disease and the doctor will tell you you are suffering from a disease or you have a problem in your colon or you have a problem in the kidney, you will not say, okay, no problem, I will continue living till the age of 50 and then you do the operation. You will see to it, it's done immediately because you know there are chances that you'll die before that. You may not live till the age of 50. It's illogical for you to say that you want to postpone. And you know that while doing the operation, there may be certain pain. There may be certain discomfort. But what you will say, okay, the discomfort will be for maybe for a few minutes or maybe for a few hours or maybe for a few days. But compared to your life that you live, for approximately 75 years and if your remaining life may be approximately 40 years if you have discomfort for a few days after the operation you wouldn't mind that discomfort as long as your balanced life is pain free or if someone says I want to give you an injection to cure your illness you know when the injection is given you will feel the prick of the needle it may be for one second it may be for two seconds while the medicine is going in. But you know that the pain for that one second or two second or few second compared to the balance of your life, which is 50 years, 60 years, 70 years, is negligible. So similarly, if you compare this life that the average human being lives for about 75 to 80 years as compared to the hereafter, the life in the hereafter is eternal. So if you compare, even if you live up to the age of 80 or 90 or 95, Compared to the hereafter, it is 0 0.000000, I don't know when will the one come. It is a small fraction of a fraction of percentage of the next life. The next life is eternal forever, abadan. And this life, 
where they will live for say 70 years, 80 years, 90 years, even 100 years. It is absolutely negligible. It is not at all comparable. So would you not mind undergoing if you feel it is uncomfortable following all the commandments or is discomfort staying away from the haram but compared to the next life it is 0.0001% nothing so logical person would say I wouldn't mind this discomfort if it's a discomfort if I agree with you it's a discomfort and following the commandments of Allah and staying away from the sin as long as in the akhirah you go to Jannah I'll give you one more example that if there is a tumor a tumor is an excessive an abnormal growth of cells people say cancer right word is tumor there are two types of tumor one is the benign which is non-cancerous tumor and the other is a malignant tumor or a cancerous tumor the difference between the two is that the benign tumor it grows very slowly it does not normally cause harm to the body or very little harm it cannot cause death the malignant tumor which is the cancerous tumor it grows very fast it has metastasis it spreads in the body it causes damage to the body and there are chances you can even die so if you give an example or an analogy i would say that the malignant tumor or the cancerous tumor are the major sins and the benign tumor are the minor sins a good intelligent person the moment he comes to know there is a benign tumor so you see to it that he removes it so when you know you are doing any sin whether minor or major you minor sin you stop it if you know it's a major sin then all the more reason you will be sure that you will see to it that you remove it as soon as possible you will not say that when you come to know that you have a tumor, tumor which is malignant, which is cancerous, you will not say, okay, cancerous tumor, it's only in the first stage. You know, I have got many years, 10, 15 years, let it go to the third stage, fourth stage, and that time I will remove it. People will say you are ignorant. If you come to know there is a malignant tumor, and if you come to know at an early stage, immediately you stop it. If you know that you will do certain things and get this malignancy, you will avoid it. That's the best. But if you happen to have the malignant tumor, you will see to it that you have the treatment immediately so that it will not cause damage to your body. It will not cause you death. So the major sins are like a malignant tumor. They are like cancer. And the minor sins are like the benign tumor or the benign cancer. What we have to do, let's see to it that we stay away from all the sins. But our beloved Prophet Muhammad said that, and the Quran says that you stay away from major sins and Allah will forgive your minor sins. That means as far as the major sins are concerned, not offering salah, not fasting in the month of Ramadan, backbiting, bribing, all these are major sins, drinking alcohol, these are major sins. So no way can you even continue it even for once more. They are like malignant tumor. You have to see to it that you stop it immediately. Best is to avoid. Not do it at all. If you happen to do it, stop it immediately. Otherwise, there are high chances that it will cause death to you. And our beloved Prophet said that a person who prays five times a day and from one Juma to the other, and from Ran Ramzan to the other, it washes away your sins. Now when it says washes away your sins, it talks about the minor sins, not the major sins. For the major sins, all the Islamic scholars, all the fuqah said, it is compulsory that you should ask for forgiveness. You should ask for repentance. So for a Muslim, you should abstain from all sins. But 
you should see to it that it should be multiple times more careful as far as major sins are concerned. And Imam al Dhabi, he writes in his book, Kabair, the major sins, and he lists 70 major sins. As the hadith of Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him, he said that 70 is a more correct number than 7 as far as major sins are concerned. So he listed the 70 major sins. And some scholars say that the sins are more than 70. They say these are the grave major sins. The others only major sins. And some scholars have listed more than 100, some a couple of 100. But for a Muslim, you should see to it that we should be very careful not to commit any major sin. We should see to it that we don't commit any sin. But if it's a minor sin, so at least that is acceptable that Allah, inshallah, will forgive. But the major sins, you should see to it, they are like a malignant cancerous tumor. You have to see to it that immediately it stops. If it's a benign tumor also, if you want to be healthy, you see to it that you remove that also. So for a Muslim, the best is not to commit any sins and to think that you will repent after you reach old age and Allah will forgive you, you are absolutely illogical. Even if Allah forgives you, Allah may say, okay, fine, you have done it. Maybe he will put you in hell for a few years or for 10 years or 100 years. Allah, Allah. And then put you in Jannah. Imagine, why do you want to take a risk? So the best is not to commit sin at all. Worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Believe in him. Practice Tawheed. And ask for his forgiveness. Ask for his mercy. And planning such a way, inshallah, will normally cause you more loss than good. An intelligent person. A person who is wise. Will never think that he will repent after reaching the age of 50. It is like an ignorant person saying, let the malignant tumor be in me. I want to enjoy life now. I don't want to go on operation and I will do the operation after I reach the age of 50. He's foolish. He may not reach the age of 50. He will die much before that. So that's the reason this type of thinking is totally un-Islamic. It's illogical and will cause you more loss than good. The next question, I am Muhammad Asif Hassan. I am from Dhaka, Bangladesh. I am a student. Allah said to lower your gaze when you see a woman to protect your modesty. As I am a student, some of my colleague, some of my colleague and some of my professors are women. To, to understand the lectures properly, now, some of my college professors are women. To understand the lectures properly and to listen attentively, I have to look at their faces. <coughs> what should I do? Is it a sin? A similar question is asked by Shakir Patel from Manchester, UK. Is it permissible to study in a co-education university where there is free intermingling of success? The question posed is that, is it permitted for a student to look at the teacher if she is a lady or a professor in the college if she is a lady while she is teaching so that there can be better concentration? And the second question is that, is it permissible for a Muslim to study in a co-education university where there is free intermingling of success? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran, in Surah Noor, Chapter number 24, verse number 31. That say to the believing woman, uh, say to the believing man that he should lower his gaze and guard his modesty. That means Allah is telling in the Quran to the moment, to the believing men, in Surah Noor, chapter 24, verse number 31, that they should lower their gaze and guard their modesty. That means whenever a man looks at a woman, if any brazen thought, any unashim thought comes, he should lower his gaze. So normally staring at a woman. A man staring at a woman, it is not permissible, it is haram in Islam. So based on this, but natural, if you are staring at your teacher 
who is a lady, it is against the teaching of Islam. Regarding is it permissible for a Muslim to study in a co-education university where there is free intermingling of sexes? Most of the scholars, almost all, they prohibit a Muslim from studying in a co-education institution, especially the colleges and the universities. As Allah says in the glorious Quran, in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 32, Come not close to adultery, for it is an evil opening other roads to evil. Quran says, Quran in this verse in Surah Isra, chapter 17, verse number 32, does not say don't commit zina. We know zina is the major sin. Here in Surah Isra, chapter 17, verse number 32, Allah says, Come not close to zina. Come not close to fornication. Come not close to adultery. For it is an evil opening other roads to evil. That means even coming close to things that will make you do zina later is haram. And all these things that Islam has prohibited are things which will make you do Islam, make you do zina. And when you are studying in a co-education, in a university or college, there are high chances that you will do things which are haram. There are high chances that you will do things which will lead you to zina. According to the research in the western countries, a lady, by the time she passes her university, according to statistics of USA, 95% of the women, by the time they pass the university, they lose their virginity. In most of the European countries that you find, some say 92%, some say 93%, some say more than 95%, all of them are more than 90 to 95%. They say that by the time the girl finishes her college or finishes the university, 90 to 95%, 97%, 98% of them lose their virginity. So this is what happens in co-ed education. And there are various reasons for that. There is, and today's scientific research they tell us that there was a survey done in UK in the performance of the students in a co-education school and a co-education college as compared to a single sex school or a single sex college. The report said that students in a single sex school perform better than a co-ed school. Students in a single sex university perform better than a co-ed education, co-education university. And we know the reason very well. That means the students in a co-ed school are more interested in trying to impress the friends of the opposite sex than to consider on the study. This is common and that's the reason UK government was encouraging single sex schools and single sex colleges. And it's quite obvious that there are things which are prohibited that can happen if you are studying in a co-ed college or a co-ed university. It's difficult that you study in the university and you would not have to look at women or not look at ladies, whether they're in hijab or not in hijab. So as I said, according to Surah Noor, chapter number 24, verse number 31, it is prohibited for a man to stare at a woman. There may be occasion that you may have to shake hands. And imagine in a co-education university, if a girl comes and wishes you, how are you, and puts a hand forward. Most of the time, you will put your hand forward also. It is difficult for you to refuse a handshake if a girl stretches a hand to shake hand with you. Only if you are trained in advance or you are mentally prepared in advance what to do if a woman stretches a hand and how to refuse, there are high chances that you too will shake hands. You may be a good Muslim, you may be a practicing Muslim, but if a lady puts a hand forward and says, how are you? Hello, good morning, good evening. What did you do? There are high chances you will shake hands. And shaking hands with an amiram is haram. There are high chances that you may have to sit together close to her in the classroom. So all these things are actually khutwa to shaitan. They are things.
things which lead you towards haram. And that's the reason statistics say that 95% of the girls, they lose their virginity before they pass the university. Because all these things are the stepping stone towards the greater evil, the major sin, which is zina. That is the reason if you ask me the question, is it permissible for a Muslim to study in a co-education college or university? I would say no. Even in a co-ed school, I would say no. The best is to study in a single sex school. However, when this question was asked to Sheikh Muhammad Saleh ibn Utaymi, may Allah have mercy on him, that is it permissible for a Muslim to study in a co-education university or college or a school? He said the best, it is not permitted, the best is to study in a single sex university. But as a last resort, if you cannot find an university and if you have to study as a last resort or if you are doing a speciality like a medical college and you don't find medical college of single sex. So in such situation as a last resort for higher education, you can do it if you can prevent yourselves from indulging in haram activities. That means, he said, because of the fitna today, you should not study in a co-education, but as a last resort, if you have no choice and if you have no options available, then you can as long as you see to it that you lower your gaze when you are talking or interacting to a Nameram lady. Point number two, see to it that you don't shake hands with them. Point number three, see to it that you don't sit close to them, which is common in a co-ed education, girls and boys sitting together. Number four, see to it that you are not close in one room alone with a Nameram lady. All these are prohibited. If you feel you can prevent yourself and abstain from all these sins, then it will be makru and permitted. Makru yet. Because high chances of deviating. But if you feel that once you join this institution and you cannot abstain from looking at the woman or you cannot abstain from shaking hands with them or talking with them unnecessarily, which is not required, or being with them alone, if you cannot avoid this, best is you leave that university because your deen is more important. Going to Jannah is more important than getting a degree. Because to go to Jannah, you don't require a degree. And even I agree with Sheikh, Sheikh Utaymi that it is best not to study in a co-ed college or university. But as a last resort, if you are doing a speciality, if you can take care and stay away from the sins, the minor and the major, then as the last thought, it can be makru and you can do it. Hope that answers the question. In the Facebook, we have Zubair, God protect you, Sheikh, Jadakallah, Razi Rahman, love from Bangladesh, I love you too. Saman Rashid, great respect for you, sir. Munawar Hussain Ismail, Assalamu Alaikum Hamitra wa Barakatuh, Wa Alaikum Assalamu Alaikum Hamitra wa Barakatuh, Walid Ahmad from Pakistan, Abdul Moez, Saman Rashid, Assalamu Alaikum Sir, Wa Alaikum Assalam, Alam bin Abdul Rahman, Assalamu Alaikum Hamitra wa Barakatuh, Wa Alaikum Assalam wa Hamitra wa Barakatuh, Muhammad Moezuddin, MashaAllah, From Bangladesh, how to watch Peace TV channel in Bangladesh. The best way to watch Peace TV channel in Bangladesh is that you can put a private dish. I know that the government has banned, you can put a private dish which hardly costs about 10,000 takas. You can get a private dish which is about 8 feet and put it on the roof of your house or your office and you can watch all the four channels, Peace TV English, Urdu, Bangla, Chinese, absolutely free for the rest of the life of the, of the satellite dish. Maybe 5 years, 10 years, 15 years, no problem. The other option is that you can download our app, Peace TV Network, from the App Store if you have an iPhone or from the Google Play Store if you have Android and watch all the four satellite channels live, free, absolutely. 
محمد نصیر الدین ماشاء اللہ ضیاء البوشی محمد افنان اسلام علی مصطفیٰ شیر خان السلام علیکم وعلیکم السلام نعمت زہری اس واز ان دا فیس بک وی آلسو ہیو ان دا یوٹیوب فیضان قریشی السلام علیکم وعلیکم السلام ریاض الدین السلام علیکم السلام وعلیکم السلام سمت فرمیز حمد نصار لف فرم کشمیر ای لف یو ٹو مید السرکار السلام علیکم وعلیکم السلام احسان الوریا کشن علی گمریز التاف فیضان قریشی ساہم آزمی شویب نبی عرفان ملا حاجی پیر محمد افاق احمد السلام علیکم سو وعلیکم السلام آئیم شاہان عبید اللہ لف فرم پاکستان فاطمہ سلیم السلام علیکم فرم علاباد انڈیا عبرار علی بیگ لف فرم انڈیا آئی لاو یو چو محمد معصوم علی السلام علیکم رکھتے زاکر وعلیکم السلام عرفان ملا شبانہ یاسمین آفاق احمد ساجد افتی I love you Dr. Zakir I love you too جزاک اللہ فال دو دواز میں اللہ اکسپٹ اٹھ اور میں اللہ سبحانہ وتعالی ایون گیو دی بیسٹ تو آل افیو ان دی دنیا ان دا آخرہ The next question, my name is Hussein Abdullahi. I am from Kenya and I am a student. What is the best reply that can be given to a Christian who usually asks, will Islam make me a rich person? Question asked is that what will you reply to a Christian friend who says that will Islam make me a rich person? We have to first try and find out what do you mean by rich? What is true richness? What is true wealth? And secondly, what type of richness are you talking about? Is it temporary or is it permanent? And who is the person? Who is the best person who can give you the riches and the wealth? The best is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the owner of the whole universe. He is the creator of the full universe. And according to me, Islam is the only religion which can give you true richness, true wealth and eternal wealth. As Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Ibran, chapter number 3, verse number 19, in dina in the Lail Islam, the only religion acceptable in the sight of Allah is Islam. And when you're talking about wealth, what wealth are you talking about? If you're talking about the true wealth, it is something different. What type of wealth? Is it temporary wealth or is it permanent wealth? Normally when we talk about wealth, it's about the richness, the amount of money that you earn, the position that you have in this world, you may have a good car, you may have a good house, you may have a good watch, you may have a yacht, and you call that all riches. According to me, all these are temporary. And the true richness, as Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Asr, chapter number 103, verse number 1 to 3, Wal Asr, Inna al-insana lafi khusr. إِلَّا الَّذِينْ آمَنُوا وَأَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ وَتَوَاسَوْا بِالْحَقِّ تَوَاسَوْا بِالصَّبْرِ That by the token of time, man is verily in loss. Man is in khasara, except if he has faith, if he has righteous deed, if he exhort people to patience and perseverance, and if he exhort people to the truth, if he exhort people to the truth, that is da'wah and islah, and if he exhort people to patience and perseverance. So according to Surah Al-Asr, chapter number 103, 
verse number one to three, it says there are four criteria for any human being to enter Jannah. Number one is Iman. That is faith. Number two is Amal Salihat. That is righteous deed. Number three is Watawasa Bil Haq. Invite people to truth. That is Dawa and Islam. And number four is Watawasa Bil Sabr. That inviting people to patience and perseverance. So these are the minimum four criteria for any human being to go to Jannah. And Jannah is the ultimate richness. There is nothing which is close to Jannah. So if you are talking about rich, it is Jannah. And the only way you can enter Jannah is by following Islam. And Islam is the only deen that can take you to Jannah. And as far as richness is concerned, our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, and there was a list of people who are the top 10 people in the world. And the list went on. That Ambani is there, then maybe ninth on the list, then fourth was, uh, fifth was Bill Gates, and uh, uh, sorry, fourth was Warren Buffett, third was Bill Gates, second was Jeff Bezos, who was number one? Number one is the Muslim who offers two raka sunnah before the Fajr Salah. The reason is, our beloved Prophet Muhammad said that any Muslim who performs two raka sunnah before the Fajr Salah, it is more valuable than the earth and the wealth in it. The earth and the wealth in it. Imagine the Prophet said, if you offer two raka sunnah before the Faraz Fajr Salah, talking about Faraz Fajr Salah, before that, that is the sunnah. If the sunnah is equal to the earth and the wealth in it, what will be the value of the Faraz Salah? Multiple times more. And there is no human being in the world which owns or has wealth equal to the wealth in the world. Even Beth, Jeff Bezos, he may be having $100 billion, $150 billion, $200 billion. This is nothing compared to the wealth in the world. So Prophet said that a Muslim who offers two raka sunnah before the Fajr Salah, it is more valuable than the earth and the wealth in it. And furthermore, there is a verse in the Quran which says that on the day of judgment, these kafir, these non-Muslims, they will tell that we would not mind giving you the, all the wealth in the world in exchange to save us from the hellfire. That means on the day of judgment, the non-Muslim will agree that they have done shirk, they have done something wrong. They will not say that Allah is just. They will say we don't mind giving you all the wealth in the world. Those will not have it. And Allah will not accept that even if they have the wealth in the world, it will not prevent them from going into hell. So the true wealth is Akhirah Jannah. And if you strive for Akhirah, Allah says He will give you Akhirah as well as the dunya. You see that even the wealth they are talking about, normal wealth, Allah will bestow on you. Allah bestows or not, that is irrelevant. The main wealth, the main richness in the Akhirah, it is Jannah, it is eternal. Therefore, the only way you can enter Jannah is by being a practicing Muslim, having Iman, having righteous deed, exhorting people to truth and exhorting people to patience and perseverance. So I would say that Islam is the only deen, the only way of life that can give you the true richness and wealth and the ultimate everlasting wealth in the world, which is Jannah, which is in the Akhirah. The next question. I am Rohit Prasad from New Delhi, India. According to your knowledge, 
which religion is the best to follow after Islam? It's a very important question. That which is the best religion to follow according to me after Islam? Allah says in the glorious Quran, in Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 19, in the Dina in the Lail Islam, the only religion acceptable in the sight of Allah is Islam. And Allah gives the reply to this question. Also in Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 85, that if anyone desires a religion other than Islam, it will never be accepted of him. And he would be amongst the losers in the hereafter. That means Islam is the only correct religion in the world. There is no other religion that is correct. There is no other religion which is close to Islam. So you are asking me that according to me which is the next best religion after Islam. I said I don't know of any religion which is anywhere close to Islam. I don't know any religion which is true except Islam. It is like you asking me that can you tell me which God besides Allah is the second best God. I said, Islam is very clear cut. La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. That there is no God but Allah and Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. That means I bear witness that there is no Allah, that there is no God but Allah. That means there is no God except Allah. The only one true God with a capital G is Allah. You cannot ask me who is the ne next best God after Allah. You cannot compare anyone. There is no one anywhere close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That there is nothing like him. There is no one 50%, 10%, 1%, no one close to even 0 0.000, even a small percentage. No. Same way in the deen of Islam, the only religion correct is Islam. And anyone who follows any other religion of Islam, it will, never be accepted for, it will never be accepted from him. And he will be amongst the losers in the Akhira. So according to me, there is only one right religion, Islam. There is no other religion anywhere close to it. No other religion can take you to salvation. No other religion can save you from the torment of hell except Islam. Hope that answers the question. The next question, Assalamu alaikum sir, Ramiz Rahman from West Bengal, India is wearing shorts while playing football haram. The question posed is that can we wear shorts while playing football, is it haram or is it permissible? As far as wearing shorts is concerned, your shorts should cover the aura. That is the minimum private part that should be covered. The aura in the male for the Muslim man, it is from the navel to the knee. There are differences of opinion regarding whether the navel should be included or not, whether the knee should be included or not, according to the Hanafi school of thought, even the knee is included in the aura. All agree it's from navel to the knee, but Hanifi school of thought, even the knee is included. According to Imam Shafi and Imam Malik, they say that only that which is between the navel and the knee is the aura, should be covered. Means the navel doesn't fall in the aura, neither the knee falls in the aura, but this is just a small difference. We agree that the right ruling is the right ruling is. It is between the navel and the knee. The navel and the knee don't come in the aura. This is the correct opinion. But I would rather say that for safety, it is preferable that you cover your navel as well as the knee. Because if you are going to play football or if you are going running or if you are wearing shorts for sports, your short should be long enough to cover the aura that between the navel and the knee. Preferable it even covers the knee because you know it can shift. So according to me, it's better that it covers the knee and covers the navel also. So they're a little bit extra. So while you're playing football, while you're jumping around, while you're kicking, 
there are chances that your shots will shift. So the longer it is, the better it is. So for safety, I would recommend it should be below the knee at least, so that there are less chances that your aura, the portion between the navel to the knee, is exposed. So that is the reason you can play sports, whether it be running, whether it be football, whether it be hockey, you can wear shorts, but the shorts should cover, it should cover the aura that between the navel and the knee, preferably even cover the navel as well as the knee. Hope that answers the question. Assalamu alaikum, I'm from Bangladesh. Is it a sin if a man did not tell his first wife before marrying a second wife? The question poses is that is it a sin if a man was already married, if he takes a second wife, is it a sin if he does not tell his first wife? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the glorious Quran in Surah Nisa chapter number 4 verse number 3, Marry women of your choice in twos, threes or fours. But if you can't do justice, marry only one. So Allah gives the permission for a Muslim man to marry two, three or four women. But if they can't do justice, marry only one. So in Islam, it is permitted to marry up to maximum four wives. But if you can't do justice between your wives, then Allah says marry only one. So based on this, it is not required for a married man to take the permission of his wife before marrying a second woman. Neither is he obliged or neither is it compulsory for him to inform the first wife that he is going to take a second wife. Unless it is mentioned in the Nikanama when they got married that he will not marry a second wife. Because in Islam, while marrying, it is permitted for the husband and wife would-be to mention any clause in the contract. For example, a wife, while marrying a man, can put a clause that since marrying more than one wife is not compulsory in Islam, I would want you not to take a second wife as long as I live. And if he signs that, then it is not permissible for him to marry a second wife. If he has to do that, he has to take permission. But if this clause is not mentioned in the Nikanama, that the man should not take a second wife, if it is not mentioned, then he need not take permission from the first wife, he need not inform. But I feel personally that it is preferable, it is mustahab, that he, the, if he doesn't take permission, no problem, at least he should inform the wife. Because if he doesn't inform the first wife that he is going to marry a second wife, what will happen? But natural, he will give excuses when he goes to meet his second wife. He will say, I am going for some work in the office. I am going out for a vacation with my office mates. And bound to be, he will be saying many lies. So according to me, though it is not a fard for a man to take permission from the first wife or inform the first wife before he is marrying the second wife, I would personally feel it is preferable at least that he informs her so that there is less sins or lying etc. after he married the second wife. And but natural, if a man marries more than one wife, he should see to it that he should do justice between both the wives. If he cannot do justice, then it is not allowed for him to take a second wife. Hope that answers the question. The next question, my name is Umar Khurshid and I am a student from Kashmir. The below question was asked by a Christian on Facebook. What was the religion of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu before he was appointed as a Prophet? Before I reply to this question, I would like to remind that most of the non-Muslims and even some of the Muslims have a misconception 
that Islam is a new religion that came into existence after Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him and they believe that Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him is the founder of the religion of Islam. Let me tell you, Islam is there since time immemorial, since man set foot on this earth. And Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him is not the founder of the religion of Islam, but he's the last and final messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our first prophet is Adam peace be upon him and then there are 25 messengers mentioned by name in the glorious Quran and our beloved Prophet Muhammad said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent 124,000 messengers on the face of the earth. Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him is not the founder of Islam but he is the last and final messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So regarding the question, what was the religion of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him before he got prophethood? And we know Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him got prophethood at the age of 40. So what was the religion before that? Our beloved Prophet Muhammad he was born in Deen al-Fitr. He was born in the innate religion. And that is what a Prophet said, that every human being, whether he's born in a Muslim family or a non-Muslim family, he is born in Deen al-Fitr. That means he is on the straight path, he's born as a Muslim. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad before he got Prophet, he was a Muslim. And all the messengers that came before Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, even they were Muslim. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 52, that Isa alayhi salam, he was a Muslim. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Imran, chapter 3, verse number 67, that Abraham, peace be upon him, he was not a Jew or a Christian, but he was a Muslim. So our beloved Prophet Muhammad, وسلم, before he became a Prophet, also was a Muslim. People think that Islam came into existence after Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him and after the Quran. No, it's there since time memorial, but Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him is the last and final messenger. And Allah says in the Quran in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 3, On this day have I perfected a religion for you and have chosen for you Islam and have complete my favor on you. So this verse of the Quran, Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse number 3, is the last verse to be revealed in the Quran or one of the last verses to be revealed in the Quran and from this we come to know that Prophet Muhammad was the last messenger as Allah says in the Quran in Surah Azab chapter 33 verse number 40 مَا قَانَ مُحَمَّدٌ أَبَا أَحَدٍ مِرْجَالِكُمْ وَلَا خِرُ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ وَخَاتَ مِنْ نَبِينَ وَقَانَ اللَّهِ بِكُلَّ شَيْنْ عَلِيمًا That Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him is not the father of any of you men but he is the seal of the Prophet and Allah is all knowing full of wisdom. So Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him was a Muslim, he believed in Tawheed, he believed in one God. But at the time of the Prophet, majority almost all the Arabs, they were pagans, they were idol worshippers. And Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him came from the tribe of Quraysh. And the Quraysh was known to have believed in a pantheon of gods. They believed in many gods, but they also had the key to the Kaaba. And the Kaaba housed many gods. So this was at the time of the Prophet, the tribe which Prophet came to. They were Mushriks, they were, they were not Muslims. But Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he specifically, mashallah, he was a Muslim. Muslim means a person who submits his will to Almighty God. And Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, before he became a Prophet also, he submitted the will. And all the Prophets of God, they were Muslim. As I quoted to you, that Isa was a Muslim according to Surah Imran chapter 3, uh, verse 52. Abraham was a Muslim according to Surah Imran chapter 3, verse 67. And Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him also, he was a Muslim. And during prophethood, at the age of 40, he became a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Before that, he was a Muslim. After the age of 40, when the verses were revealed, he became a prophet of God and he guided the people, the humankind, from darkness to light. As Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 107, Allah says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةِ الْعَالَمِينَ That we have sent thee not but as a mercy to the whole of humanity, as a mercy to all the world, as a mercy to all the creatures. Hope that answers the question.
we have on the Facebook Said Sakif, Sher Khan, Dilawar Sidar, Musaib ibn Nusrat, Ali Mustafa, Muhammad Afnan Islam, Zia Al Boshi, Javed Hussein, Abdul Hussein, Umar Anas, Nadira Rasamalla Otara, Muhammad Nasiruddin, Abdul Bakir, Abdul Moiz, M. H. Hussein, Muhammad Moiz Uddin. You have on the YouTube Shweb Khan, Abu Laish, Purwanchal Students Union. Tasmiya Podan, Sayyid Faisal, Rizwan, all these are from the YouTube. Read the next question. Assalamu alaikum. I am a student from Dhaka, Bangladesh. I like a boy who is a practicing Muslim and also has very good character. He is studying and also works in halal ways. He is not very rich but is a hard working person. My parents don't want me to get married to him because he is not good looking and not very rich. I have tried to convince them a lot, but they said that if I want to get married to that boy, I have to do it myself. They won't get me married to him because he is not rich and not good looking. I really want to marry him soon to avoid sins. What should I do? The question posed by a girl in Bangladesh is that she likes a boy and she thinks that he is Islamic and follows the halal way, etc. But her parents aren't agreeing because they say that he's not rich and he's not good looking. But the girl wants to marry him because she thinks that he's the one who bought her, uh, that he, she thinks that he's on the straight path and she thinks that he's a practicing Muslim in the halal way. So what should be done? Such type of questions where a girl or a boy wants to marry someone and the parents are not agreeing is very common. Let me tell you that if the girl is saying that the boy is good and the parents are saying boy is not good, generally the chances are 50-50 both can be right. Either the girl or the boy in simple calculation. But I being in the field and many a time people ask me question, I would say that in such situation where the parents are disagreeing and the woman or the girl wants to marry a person, I would say here that the chances of the parent being right is more than the girl. The reason is that the parents have bought you up, they love you, they care for you and they want the best for you but you may be infatuated, you may start liking a person because of infatuation and you may start thinking oh to give it some sort of legitimization oh he is Islamic he does things in a halal way my question is that what you are saying may be true may not be true I don't know in the general perspective may be 50-50 but seeing the scenario I would say that in such cases two third of the time the parents are correct and one third of the time, maybe the girl may be correct. Because many a times the women get infatuated and they get married or they, uh, they may mix with some people and they may start liking, they can be an infatuation and then they say that the person is Islamic, maybe, in this case maybe, but generally I would say in such cases 
five percent or more, more than two third times, the parents are right, and the girl is wrong. Now, now coming to the question, what should be done? If you are so confident that the boy is Islamic and good, my suggestion to you would be go to the Imam of that local mosque where he's living. If he's practicing, he has to pay five times in the mosque. If he's paying five times salah in the mosque, you can very well send your brother or send some of your then of some some of your acquaintance to go and ask the Imam of the mosque where he lives close by that does this boy come five times to salah? Does he pray five times? How is he? And ask questions. This will give you some idea about the boy. Number two, you can ask from the Secretary General or the President of the Islamic organization which is close to your area. And I'm sure that now there are many Islamic organizations you can very well go to the head of the Islamic organization and ask their view that how do they consider this particular person. In this case, it's uh, Bangladeshi. How do you consider him? Is he good? Is he practicing? Does he have any vices? And these things will surely help you to know about the boy. And what you can do that if you really think he's Islamic, etc., you can ask the Imam of the mosque where he prays or the Dawah organization of the mosque to go and approach the parents of the boy and on your behalf they can approach and since he is asked to do certain changes in, in, in this case you can very well send your brother or some of your relatives should, to speak to the Imam of the mosque or the local organization and if they say he is good and practicing tell them to convince your parents. And surely the Imam of the mosque comes and verifies that I know that this person is good, Islamically, of a salah, he, he prays and does not have any vices, etc. They will be able to convince your parents about the situation. And inshallah, if the boy is genuine, your parents will agree. But as a general policy, see to it that you love your parents and you obey them. And in this case, if the Imam of the mosque or the head of the Islamic organization helps you and comes onto the street and identify that the boy is good and if you get married good that's good Alhamdulillah otherwise even if you come to know that the boy is not good you may think he's Islamic because of infatuation but the Imam may tell you no he doesn't come to Salah at all I see him only on Jummah or the Islamic organization head would say that you know Islamic so here you will be saved because many a times it's your infatuation that you start thinking the person is good so my advice to, to you would be check up with the local Muslims who are more well versed in that area and if he's really good ask them to inform your parents and inshallah if he's good your parents will agree hope that answers the question The next question. May God's peace and mercy be upon you, Dr. Zakir. It's a great honor that I am contacting you, Dr. Zakir. My name is Hazim. I am from Mansura, Egypt. Why do all the messengers come with the truth and say, follow me? At the same time, they say, follow the messenger who comes after me. What is the wisdom of that? Why do we not follow the one who came with the truth the first time? The question posed is very important and this question is asked by many non-Muslims also that why do the messengers when they come they say I speak the truth and you follow the messenger to come after me why don't we have only one messenger who came at the first 
who are truthful and that's it. <clears throat> and many non-Muslims also say that why Allah sent so many messengers and there's confusion, etc. He should have said first messenger, only one messenger and the problem will be solved. It is like when you go to school, you attend the first standard and the teacher teaches you and, and you agree the teacher is correct, the teacher is truthful. Then the teacher says now one year has passed, next year, <coughs> next year you will be going to standard 2 and you have to follow the teacher of standard 2 and he is also very good and listen to him, he is truthful. Then you go to standard 2. Then after the second year is over, the teacher will say, okay, now you have passed standard 2, now go to standard 3. Imagine you come and say that why is the, I am going to standard 1 first, then finishing standard 1, then the standard 1 teacher is saying go to standard 2, then standard 2 is saying go to standard 3. Why doesn't the teacher in standard 1 teach me about the portion of standard 10th in the first year itself? Why should I wait for 10 years? And the reply would be, it's illogical. Because the child who, and who admits himself to standard 1 is of the age of 5 or 6, he cannot comprehend what is taught in standard 10. So what does he do? He first studies what is according to his level and the teacher teaches him. Then the teacher says you go to standard 2. Then standard 2 teaches him because he's grown more matured. In this way, Every year he keeps on passing and after 10 years he reaches standard 10 and then studies about standard 10. He cannot say that you teach me of standard 10 in the first level only when I am at the age of 6 and that will be the best shortcut, no confusion. No, because the child is not able to grasp. Similarly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the face of the earth sent 124,000 messengers and the last and final messenger was Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent several revelations before. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Raw chapter number 13 verse number 38 that وَقُلِّنْ أَجْلِنْ kitab And in every age have we sent a revelation. By name there are only four revelations mentioned in the Quran. The Torah, the Zabur, the Injil and the Quran that is the Furqan, the last and final revelation. But there were many other revelations sent for example Sufa, Ibrahim etc. Similarly in the Quran there are 25 messengers mentioned by name. Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, peace be upon them all. But the beloved Prophet said, there were 124,000 messengers sent on the face of the earth. All the messengers that came early were only meant for those people in that time. But Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was the last and final messenger meant for the whole of humanity. So the reason Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the Quran, the last and final revelation, and sent the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, approximately 1400 years ago, because Allah is our creator. He knew that if this message was revealed maybe 5,000 years back, 10,000 years back, humankind were not developed enough to grasp it. Allah is the creator of human beings. He knows that 1400 years ago is the right time that the human being could understand the message and absorb it and implement on it. That is the reason he sent the last and final revelation in the Quran. 14 years ago and he sent the last and final messenger Prophet Muhammad 14 years back. You cannot say that why did Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him did not come instead of Prophet Adam. At that time the people would not be able to understand and grasp the message of Islam. As time went on and human being developed, Allah is our creator, he knows very well, he has ilm gap he revealed the Quran at the right time when human beings could absorb it and send the right messenger, the last and final messenger. And then the Quran says in Surah Maida chapter 5 verse number 3, On this day have I perfected my religion for you and have chosen for you Islam and have completed my favor on you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his divine wisdom, he knew when to reveal at what time. That is the reason he kept it at the right time 14 years back. It is illogical for us to say that why didn't he send the first messenger and the Quran before the human being would not be able to grasp it. Hope that answers the question and we are running short of time and that was the last question that I could reply and till we meet next time for the next session of Ask Dr. Zakir Naik uh, next Saturday that is 11.30 Malaysian time, 6.30 Makkah time, 3.30 GMT till we meet again. 
السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ و آخر الدعوان الحمد للہ رب العالمین